Well, now, in um, 334 BC, Alexander the Great decided to start his own venture. And his venture was going to be the biggest enterprise of the time. And, of course, that was to conquer the known Persian Empire and then to go across the Indus and conquer the unknown India, or at least unknown to him and the Greeks. And that's actually where the story for what is the Internet of Me, which you've all got in your newspapers, begins, all the way back then. So why does it begin with Alexander the Great, you might say? Well, that's because at uh, five years old in the UK, the way you learnt to read more and learnt uh, your English was through a series of Ladybird books. And Ladybird had a series on everything, the great historians, the great uh, warriors, of course, and all sorts of things. And I still recall, to this day, getting my Alexander the Great book. It's a very thin book, history of a great man in a very small thing. And on about page six or seven, in 333 BC, there's a picture of him, and he's standing in a temple in a place called Gordium. So some of you may know where this is going. And in Gordium, there was a ox cart yoked to, or that means tied, to a pillar. And the, of the day, they said whoever could untie this fiendishly complex knot, the Gordian knot, would rule the whole world. So Alexander the Great looked at this fiendishly complex knot, and you can bet some other people had tried to undo it, and he looked at it, he pulled out his sword, and he chopped it in half, and he said it's untied. Great. Now, I still remember that. And what that tells me and reminded me then was that there is always a simple solution. And you heard that, in fact, as number two on the things that you need to make a good company, keeping it simple. So why a simple solution and where does that lead us? Well, that leads us on to my favourite person, a guy called Oliver Wendell Holmes. And I can never remember whether it's senior or junior when you look him up. And he said, I don't give a fig about the simplicity this side of complexity, but I'd give my life for the simplicity the other side of complexity. Now think about that, because often when we think about simple solutions, they really aren't going to do the job. At the best, they're a temporary fix. So we get, make them more complex, and then we add an extra layer, and we climb this hill of complexity, and we eventually get somewhere, and we say, yes, it'll do the job. It's a bit ugly, it's a bit, yeah, but it does the job. But when somebody has that inspiration and they can go right through that hill to the other side with a really simple solution, like chopping that knot, we go, of course, it's obvious. And that, to me, is the most important thing you can be as an entrepreneur, is to try and come up with that simplicity, the other side of complexity, <coughs> as a solution. Because if you can, you'll be successful. So if we run forwards... God knows how many years, um, to 1986 when I set up my first business, a company called Stasis. Now, I was all of 23. I just happened to be in the right, time, right place, the right time, that I was an expert in what we would now call the military internet. Um, I had been integrating the very first items of that on a fighter aircraft. So Having looked at the company I was in and deciding I wasn't going to go any further because it was dead men's shoes time, I thought I'll go out at 23 and be a military systems consultant. Hmm. Seemed like a good idea. The fact that everyone else was in their 40s didn't seem to worry me too much. We started off, things were going okay. We were trying to bring lots of different platforms. That means fighter aircraft, command and control aircraft, ships and tanks and all of these things together in a network for the first time ever. And I really mean the first time ever we'd brought all these different things together. And these are programs, and each and every one of them, it's about a billion dollars or two billion dollars or ten billion dollars worth of program, each with their own immensely complicated procurement timescales. And we tried to have standards, as you do, standards for the internet, standards for everything else. And I worked on those standards for governments and for businesses with my company, and we were growing. And it struck me that this would never work. And it would never work because what happened is every platform would be full of contradictions. People would only implement some of the standard because they didn't have all the money. And the operational requirement would be more for the missiles or the radar than the comms. Or people would implement it wrong and the timescale would take longer. And when you tried to bring things together, you could see over a few years that this would never work. Because you didn't know what they were doing wrong. We had a black hole 
we called it the black hole of interoperability. So when you brought platforms together and the whole thing failed, and it could fail terribly, it could fail so that you didn't see targets that you needed to see or that you suddenly invented a whole load of new things and went, yee, they've got an amazing number of planes coming at me or whatever it would be. And you couldn't do anything about it. And that's when I actually had my first real flash of inspiration and I remembered Alexander the Great. Because I said, we'll never fix it if we carry on doing it the same way. And the same way was, yes, contract company A to do to the spec, modified, of course, for that contract, then let them write all the software with all the complex integration, then do the tests, pretend that all the tests passed, the important ones, but not the other ones, don't worry about those, um, and then put it into service, and of course, it'll all fail. Great. But what if we did something different? What if we said to ourselves, for each of those platforms, they are never going to be perfect. They are always going to be different than the specification says. There will always be software errors when it comes into service. And what if we said to the contracts, we don't mind. Radical thought, we don't mind you not meeting your contract. As long as you document it, as long as we have a document of all the differences from this standard and what we want to do. Because then if we've got all of your differences and all of your differences, we can assess them and create workarounds. We can create a white hole. We know what's missing. We can create workaround. We can do and get interoperability. Well, that idea, and there's a lot more to it, but I'll leave it like that. That idea morphed into a thing called iSmart. That is now an international standard. It's mandated by all the US forces throughout NATO, throughout the Western world, and in Australia, and New Zealand, Malaysia, and all the rest of it. Because we just had a simple idea. And the simple idea was accepting the fact that we had, it, had to manage imperfection rather than aiming for perfection. So I built that business. Um, it went fairly well. We ended up doing the same thing in military, in space, uh, would you believe, and in air traffic management. And I sold it to Lockheed Martin in 2005. I worked for them for a couple of years and then I retired. Happily, at 44 years old, I'm retired, got money in the bank, go around the world, have a great time, which I did. Then I came back and I was bored because I'm an entrepreneur and I think many entrepreneurs will realize you get bored very quickly. Fun investing in other businesses. I know a little of what it must be like to be a VC or whatever else and looking at these things saying no, which crushes everybody, of course, we know that, but sometimes you have to say no, saying yes and having the emotional high with them. And that was okay, but I really was still bored. So I thought, well, I'll start an innovation hub and think of some ideas. But because I was bored, I made a fundamental mistake. I forgot simplicity, the other side of complexity. And I came up with this, what was a great idea for file sharing and uh, managing your data and everything else. And we even implemented it. And I spent a million pounds of my money and some of other people's money. But I never got round to being able to explain it simply to people. So it wasn't good enough to have an idea which was probably slightly on the simplicity simplicity the other side of complexity side but not enough but I'd failed to think also about how I was going to explain it could I explain it simply and people just didn't get it and in the end it became obvious after about three years that I needed to close it and that was painful for me it's my first big failure and it was also a lot of my own personal money and some other people's money of people I knew because I'd forgotten that simplicity the other side of complexity mattered not just in the technology, but in how we describe things. So we then did have another good idea, um, a thing called DigiMe, which leads us on to the Internet of Me. So my job is to explain that to you. Um, and I want you to keep that thought of simplicity because we've got a complex problem today. And the problem relates to our personal data. So we all know what personal data is. It's our social data that people take and rob from behind us, or it's our tracking us on the web, or it may be some positional information and stuff like that. And we know that we're on a privacy sharing seesaw in that if I can somehow manage my sharing, but I'm still going to lose privacy and that happens. And if I want more privacy, then I have to share less. But then that means I can't get advantages that people can do from looking at that data and personalizing things for me. And then a lot of that data that is shared is in the hands of very few, very few companies. So most of the startups here would find it very difficult to get hold of that data and do innovative things for us. 
And then a lot of our data isn't available to anybody, really, just one or two people. So all of your bank data held by the bank, but nobody else, your credit cards, all of your health data locked away with your GP or the hospital systems. And so it goes on. So how can we end up using all of that data, doing more with it? Well, we've got to find a way to do it privately. So of course we have to have a simple solution. And you'll be glad to know that there is a very simple solution. Give the data back to each of you. You should have all of your data. So that's what we did. We have implemented it in, is that simple? You download Digimi to your phone or device. You choose where you want the data stored. Any personal cloud of your choice, Dropbox, Google Drive, or a NAS drive at home, it doesn't matter. And then you choose what data you would like back, a full copy, not just access to it, but all your bank data, all your health records, all your social data, what you've purchased, everything. And your DigiMe will go and get it directly. Really, really important that my company doesn't see, touch, or hold your data ever, ever. We know nothing about you. So you end up with your own 100% private library of information, all fully secured. It's not really hackable because of the security, but it's also distributed, which means it's beyond the economic value for anyone to hack an individual library. So you've now got this data. Well, that's great, but what are you going to do with it? Well, the first thing you can do with it is do more yourself. So we saw how understanding your uh, various data for your menstrual cycle and everything else illuminates people. Imagine if you can have that sort of level of illumination for everything, from your finances, your health, so on and so forth. That is quite exciting. So let's have a look at that first. So if you could play the video, please. Um, and then I'll talk about the second bit, which is at the end of the video. So you've got all your data, which you put wherever you want to put it, and it'll all be secured in there. So obviously you have a password. You connect your various sources and you get the full data back that you can see. And now you can manipulate it. You can get search the data so you can see it. You get search and you get insights with it. This is a particularly bad day where somebody broke their leg and went to hospital. I hope you appreciate the Icelandic health data here. <laughs> now this is the next stage, so just have a look at this. This is where you're consenting for another app to look at your data. And with a consent certificate, and you can actually see the data you're going to give if you say yes. So this data has now received, this app has received the data and has created an analytics, doesn't matter that it's ephemeral, that's just a demo. But the most important thing there was you got all of your data. And I'm pleased to announce that courtesy of your government, the Icelandic government and the Directorate of Health, they have created over the last year the very first, the world's first patient-facing API. So you can, in Iceland, starting from today, if you go to digi.me slash startup Iceland and register, you'll be able to download all of your health data in Iceland along with your social data and bank data and more coming. And Datica Labs, um, Bala, is working with the community to then build on top. So what do I mean about building on top? Well, you've got that data yourself. But now, companies could ask you for data rather than going down behind your back. And they could ask you for what we call rich data because you've now got wider across all your categories, social, health, financial, positional, messaging, your media, etc. Deeper in terms of time, because you've got all of your time. If you put Facebook, by the way, you'll get your last nine years worth of Facebook data come down, which is fascinating to look at, um, but along with all your health, right? But you've also got it in one place. So what a company can now do is use our certificate system where they say to you what data they'd like, what they're going to do with it and give you back, the value exchange, 
Will they store any data on their servers? Will they share it with third parties? And will they implement a thing called right to forget, which is part of the new European General Data Protection Regulations? But here's the key. They don't have to take the data off your device. They could if it was for research. But let's imagine I'm going to a bank and I want to buy a new car. So I'm going green, I want to buy a Tesla, and it's going to cost me a fair amount of money. So I go to the bank and I say, can I have a loan? He says, well, you've got no credit history. I go, ah. But I've got lots of my bank data. He says, no problems, Julian. Download our bank app to your phone. So I take out my phone, download the bank app. It asks me for five years worth of my financial information. And I allow it to do that, say yes. And then it can calculate my credit worthiness on my phone and only send the credit worthiness to the bank. So I've shared a lot of information, but in reality, I've only shared the credit worthiness. So I'm very happy because I've been able to give a lot of data. The bank is inordinately happy because they've got a really accurate score. They haven't had to store all that data and worry about compliance and everything else. And they can give me the service that I want. And you can do this innovate anybody in startup Iceland, anyone anywhere can innovate and start to think of new services when they can have access to any data. So think of a life insurance company. We work with a life insurance company. What do they do for you? They take your money and then when you've got a claim, they might pay it. They might. They don't help keep you healthy. Why? Because the biggest cost to them is your claims. Surely they should help keep you healthy. They haven't worked out how they could do it, but now they can. It has been proven in a big program, six million plus people in the US, that if you can just see your data, your health data, you'll be more engaged with it. And you will therefore be healthier. You'll have better conversations with the GP. What if that, you could then not just be engaged with it, what if you could download an app from the health insurance company, a Healthy Me app, say, that would help you see all your data, be able to use it, go anywhere in the world, you can show people your data and email them, whatever you want to do. But also that app would give you advice based upon your own circumstances. It might, if you've got your genomic data, allow you to give tailored advice or wearables. It doesn't need any data, no data needs to leave your phone, but you get this huge new service that is 100% private using all of your data. So we're way off that seesaw with this simple solution that you own the data. Now that app, by the way, is not a mystery. There's an Icelandic company called uh, Rion. They are building that app here in Iceland and it will be available for all, Ic all Icelanders as well as DigiMe. And there will be other apps being built. So as a final example, I want to give you a company in Iceland called Retina Risk. If you have diabetes, you are at danger of um, getting retina damage. So Retina Risk have come up with an algorithm to work out your susceptibility to that. They did a big study in the UK. In the UK, we send everybody with diabetes for this check. It costs the UK £100 million a year for those checks. If people had an app on their phone looking at their data, using this simple algorithm, 40% of those people wouldn't have to go and have those checks and their time, saving the UK £40 million and them time. But also importantly, those people that should go earlier would be detected and they could go earlier. A very simple app using data on your device. And so that is where we call the Internet of Me. Iceland is going to be the leading economy in doing that. And it's, I hope you'll see what I think all companies should do is it should be the simplicity, the other side of complexity. Everyone said the problem of personal data is hugely difficult to solve. They said you can't solve it and there were lots of point solutions. But you make one change, just one change, you own your data and everything else changes. Thank you very much.